Okay, welcome to uh, the second of our presentations today. We are going to go through a type of warm up today, which I call the progressive routine. And I'm joined here today with Rachel Thomas, hey Vanessa Frick, and Hillary Sims. And I'm Megan Hodge. Um, so everybody has their warm up, and there are a million out there. Um, and so this is just one of them. But in speaking with the rest of the committee uh, after last presentation, we're trying to find a way to speak to a really diverse uh, group of people. So beginners, um, pros, amateurs, you name it. We wanted to try to reach you guys. So this one, this routine that I've worked on for quite a while um, really takes you through all your basic stuff. Um, tries to bring it from the very beginning stages of that technique um, forward through a very um, long progression. So we're going to start today with resonance. And it's very similar to something you would do for long tones or something like that. But my idea behind it is to get your very, very best sound and for that to be the focus. So this first exercise that we're going to do is uh, resonance space, and we're gonna bring it up on the screen and um, go through it with you guys. And these three other fine trombonists are gonna play along with this. And as we go along, and as I describe things, they're gonna be, we're gonna have start a discussion so that we can talk about all these aspects of our playing. So the first one, so resonance. So on that first fermata, what we're gonna do is we're gonna experiment a little bit as we go through it, okay? And we're gonna experiment with vowel sounds. There's a perfect vowel sound for every note on the trombone. So I'm talking about I, -O -I so E in the high range, O in the low range. Um, so we're gonna probably be starting on a bit of an ah. But as you play this first fermata, experiment, experiment. And you're gonna find that there's gonna be a point in the sound when it all just starts to shimmer. There's tons of um, beautiful overtones going on and you're gonna be like, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so let's just start with the first fermata and we're gonna do that, I'll show you. And I hope you could hear that at the very end, I reached a point where it was much more shimmery, much nicer, okay? And then you'll see uh, a V there after that fermata, and that's a nose breath. And the reason we want to do a nose breath in this situation is so that we don't change anything. And when we re-articulate, we'll, we're gonna be coming in with our best sound because we just achieved it, right? So, and then we would continue on to the next partial, and then experiment on that fermata. When we get it, nose breath, come in with your pu perfect experimented um, note and then continue on. So I'm gonna take you through this. And again, the ladies are gonna join me. And after that, we'll talk about it and go through it. Sometimes I didn't get to my most beautiful sound. So I just took a breath, tried it again on that fermata, and kept going. Ladies? Well, I love how this is uh, reminiscent of, you know, your 
your usual long tone exercise, but something a little bit different. And I think sometimes we're told to practice long tones and as students, especially, you don't really get why, like, okay, I already learned that note. Why am I still playing it? Um, so I love this playing around with the, with the vowel. Um, I even had a teacher who would encourage me to first sing with a bunch of different vowels and find what was the most resonant on that um, pitch and then try to copy that vowel shape on the long tone that I was playing as well. Yeah. Absolutely. As long as we have a goal, right? There's lots of solutions to that for sure. And so to be clear, when you're doing it, you're not uh, you're not bending the note with your lips. Everything is happening inside your mouth. So you're just manipulating the oral cavity. Is that what you're doing? That's right. So I'm just experimenting with a uh, vowel. So I, and even if we say, I, uh, you can feel that part of the tongue moving up and down. And that's exactly what I'm doing while I'm playing. Yeah. Nice. Cool. But cool. Just to and be so clear also, you're lip bending the note like the slur. Pardon me? Right? Or, oh, sorry. I think I misunderstood. Are you the slur from B flat to F? Yeah. Or that was the vowel sound? That's right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, this li lip slur. Uh, sorry. Lip slur from B flat to F, um, gliss to the D, and right. then lip slur to the B flat. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Okay. And Megan, I was wondering, do you do this t out of time freely, or would you do this with a metronome on? This one I do freely. I don't. I don't do with a metronome because I don't want. Um, I don't want to kind of rush anything about it. I find for this kind of thing, you just want to kind of dig into the experimentation and really listening to your sound. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's move on from there. Um, so we're going to go to the second thing on my uh, uh, routine, which is the slow lip slurs. Okay, so everyone practices lip slurs. Everyone does their versions of it. There are a million books, million exercises. Um, this one is really, as I said in my intro, um, to create a foundation of really, really relaxed kind of glist um, execution of aperture uh, and sliding through those um, uh, partials, sorry. Um, so this first one, again, we're gonna be trying to gliss um, through the, the slur. Okay. And, um, what this does is it gets rid of all the bumps, all the guessing, all the slotting. So we're really joining the two partials together, uh, by gliss and there's maximum bonus points for the most amount of gliss that you can possibly get. <laughs> so this first one on the screen is, uh, totally void of time again. <laughs> um, and we want to just try to practice getting from that note to the other with, again, the most amount of gliss. So, and what we're talking about is that aperture going um, inwards or outwards, right? Um, and blowing a nice relaxed airstream through it. So the first one will sound like this. <laughs> simple, very relaxed, okay? And you'll do that in all seven positions. And as I've indicated at the bottom of this page, um, do that as well on the F to the B flat. So let's all do that one together. So free of time, just try to join those two with uh, moving the aperture very glissy, very smooth. <laughs> for as long as it takes to kind of get really nice and used to that that feeling that movement right as relaxed as we can and then 
once you really feel good about that, it can take weeks. It took me weeks. Um, what we do is we add time. So that second line would actually be with time, okay? Uh, and what we do now to speed up this movement but keep it nice and relaxed is we play the note for half of the value, gliss for half the value. So what we would hear is da. So you can hear that you're glissing for half the beat. Let's just try that now. And I'll turn on a metronome so you guys can hear me. for a couple weeks we're starting to feel really good about that gliss movement and we would do the third line so let's all try that so again half the value will be a gliss so now we're talking eighth notes da, okay let's try that one surprise when it uh, flipped the partial a little bit early or a bit late and I, I would be easy on yourself about that as long as we're glissing tons and we're getting that movement to be uh, very relaxed I think we're on the right path and I think as you can see when we start doing eighth notes when we start doing sixteenth notes at this point you're just doing a beautiful slur right and so now you've achieved beautiful lip slurs, and I would say go into the world and do all of them <laughs> as beautifully as you just created in this foundational kind of exercise. So eventually, are you aiming to condense that the glissing motion just to write as you change notes? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, how did you guys do on the gliss up? Because mine did not sound as pretty as yours. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, what are you, like, the bend down is easy, but coming up, it's it's almost kind of like, I feel like an elephant jumping up a stair or something. Yeah, it always feels to me like there's more room when you're going down, and then the ceiling is closer when you try to go up. I absolutely feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a little clunky on my end. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I would, what was I going to say? Um, sorry, I did lose my train of thought. <laughs> well, I have, a, I have a question while you look for it. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm wondering when you do it really slowly, are you meant to sort of hear a bit of a, a bit of a pop or a bit of a slam into that lower note as you change because you're kind of you're blowing down you're blowing down glissing downwards with the, the feeling in your lips and then the trombone basically decides okay now we're on the lower partial so if you're blowing full is it like is it correct that you should hear a bit of a that it should be really full at the front of that note yeah because yeah. i feel like it, otherwise it's really easy to kind of sneak in I kind of fake it. Yeah. No, the first time that you did it, the first time that you did it, I think was perfect. Um, you want to you wanna keep up the air pressure and not, not back off, not uh, back away from those changes, because that's when we run into even um, worse habits, right? <laughs> so, so we, I'm sorry, we want the elephant plop then. <laughs> there, we need yeah. that. Okay, cool. <laughs> because... When you speed it up to an actual slur speed, all that stuff goes away. You're not going to hear it because we're not like going that slowly down, right? So, yeah. And so when we develop into like lip slurs that are way more interesting than this one, right? We want to look for all those notes just into each other. So 
Right, and we're just kind of glissing into them, really, or at least that's how I like to think about it. And I find that this um, progression really allows for that feeling to be nice and forward and um, very malleable, I guess is a good word for it. If you had... Oh, man. <laughs> If you had a beginner student, um, like I've I've taught on the last couple of weeks specifically on lip slurs, and I have one student who didn't actually know how to bend the note down. And as much as I tried to explain it to him, he couldn't bend it with his aperture to put, uh, with his lips. So what would you say um, to someone who's like an absolute newbie for lip slurs? To put you on the spot completely. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, I mean, it's funny these days without cameras, right? Because yeah. I learned back in the old days um, about camera apertures and how they move like this. And I'm sure you could probably find a video of one or something, but you know, I really try to make them, yeah. You know, and I often demonstrate that exact movement of an aperture going in and out. So, sorry. And sometimes they can, with that kind of demonstration, they can start to see that it's it's just smaller and bigger versions of circles or right. circular type. Um, so potentially it'd be best to do this on a mouthpiece first, first if they're not getting it initially? If they're not getting it, yeah, that'd be a great idea. Absolutely. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to articulation now. I was just gonna add quickly though, like you're you're totally on about how important slow lip slurs are. And I was just, cause someone told me this when I was younger and now that I've been backstage at a few different concert halls, it's definitely true. Like anywhere you go in the world, you go backstage and you'll hear professional brass players still practicing their slow lip slurs all the time. It's just it's something you do for the rest of your career. So start now. <laughs> well, I think it's some of our most beautiful playing, right? Mm -hmm. you know, that we can do. Absolutely. Awesome. Now we're going to go to articulation. Okay. Every good routine, every good warm up should have some articulation. It's a lifelong thing we should do. And uh, the way that I like to present it is uh, an imagery of Buddha and ninja. Okay, so the Buddha in articulation exercises is your air. And I don't think it can be stressed enough how important air is in relation to your articulation because it can't get in the way. It can't add more <laughs> problems. And so we have to, or I like to try to simplify it. So the Buddha is just kind of sitting there meditating, just always present, always supporting always going forward okay another image i really love to present is a river flow right there's no push to that river no one's pushing it from somewhere it's just flowing and you know a smaller river is faster a bigger river it's slower you know you can get a lot of positive imagery for that so whatever you can think of buddha river fan whatever you'd like to think really try to have that in your mind and with a very relaxed uh, side to it, okay? And the second thing is the ninja. So I chose ninja because they're nimble, they're quick, they don't, you know, take any <laughs> crap. Uh, they just, they just kind of sneak out of somewhere and just go for it, okay? And that's what I found works for me the best, okay? So the first thing about the ninja is the connection, okay? The uh, punch. No, I'm kidding. Don't think about punching. Um, <laughs> so the, the place that I say to connect um, with your the front of your tongue is right above the teeth and gums for me. That's where I found uh, that that placement the, the best for uh, playing trombone. And then I like to also say that um, the connection there is as fat as possible. Okay, so so that you're really creating a good, uh, complete seal or that kind of thing, okay? And the second thing about the ninja is the speed. So again, it's always waiting to go and then it 
and then it goes. It's not creeping around the corner and showing his face and then everybody knows he's there, right? Because when we creep, when we try to like go ahead of it or come back very slowly, that's what starts to um, distort your sound. So you can go die, 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 all that kind of stuff. And then the third thing about it is different articulations. So the way that you get different articulations is how long you connect at the front for. So a legato would be very quick, right? Da, da, da. Whereas mercado, da, da, da. You can hear that that connection at the front is much longer period of time. And that's how we kind of achieve that. So again, it's I like to simplify. I like to try to get some imagery going. And so this first exercise, we're going to try to implement this. So again, the reason I like to start with half notes is not so much just because they're easier, because <laughs> I actually find them harder, um, is to try to create that beautiful, relaxed airstream. Okay. And then the waiting game is the, the thing. Remember we said nimble and quick. So da, da, right? So you're waiting till that last second. Um, and another great thing to do is um, subdividing, right? If we subdivide, we can make that ninja wait to the very last second because we're da, 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 right? So let's just try that all together. Oh, I keep turning off my net, metronome. So let's just try that all together. We'll see if we can relax ourselves, try to get that articulation to connect, be speedy, and we choose um, a very normal articulation for this one. I wasn't so nimble. Awesome. <laughs> you know, I just forgot to turn on the comments so that so we should remember to check the comments in case anybody has any questions as we go through this. Okay. Um, okay. So did you guys find that you could uh, kind of picture that ninja uh, sitting along with the Buddha? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent way of describing it. Yeah, and, and the way you use your hand too, that's a good visual. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go to the second page of articulation exercises. Okay, so once you get the unison going, um, then we work it on um intervals, right? Because that's most of what we play anyways. So um, so I like to not only do articulation exercises that are just very, very um, um, singular in nature, but I like to go through the, the intervals. So, but we apply all the same principles. And one thing I would also mention that I found is try to, try to really think of intervals as closer together than we normally do. Try not to go... D da D da right? I found a lot more success when we're we're trying to make them very similar in nature. So let's just do some of these. And I would also sorry add um, a great thing to do with intervals is first play slurred and then play the articulation. And what I listen for is or what I try to connect with is my air. So if we go so just add that articulation into the airstream rather than change any, any anything once we get to the articulation stuff. So let's just try that all together. Thank you. 
Did you guys, were you able to apply the same um, ninja Buddha kind of concepts to that one? Yes. Do you guys do anything in your warm ups that are kind of interesting for articulations? Well, I like to try to cover a variety of articulations. And so I thought it was interesting what you mentioned about, um, like, I'll usually just do a diatonic scale and pick a rhythm of the day. Da, 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 and do it with like three different types of articulation. So like a legato articulation, marcato, tenuto. Um, and you mentioned that you think about making those differences by the duration of the tongue or the timing of the tongue. And I mostly think about it um, by just thinking about which syllable I'm using. And something that's often really a new concept for some of my younger students is to really explore some of the extreme um, consonants that you could use when you're articulating, like really going for a la, 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 na, 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 to get a really smooth legato tongue. So how does that relate to, to the duration or the placement or timing of the tongue for you? Um, yeah, I would say that I didn't have a good time in my brain thinking about consonants. I just, it, it didn't work for me because and I was a pretty terrible articulation. Like it's one of the things I had to work on the most. Um, so what I mean by it is I really, so I think maybe we can hear it the best with a wind pattern. So if I were to play a legato style, I would really try to connect very, very split second at the front. So can you guys hear it? Mm -hmm. So, and then, but if I try to do a Mercado, it connects for a really long time. So you can hear that it's at the front connecting there for a longer duration. Does, does that clarify it a, a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I love hearing that because I think some things I, I, some things along the way I picked up naturally and it was easier for me just to think of, okay, now I'm saying law. Now I'm saying ta, and maybe it naturally has those different durations. Right. But for me, it would be paralysis by analysis if I tried to think about it too hard. But it's really awesome now as a teacher to be able to explain that to students who learn in different ways. So that's really helpful. <laughs> that's such a good uh... a Sorry, Megan. Sorry. I was just, I was just say gonna say we do a question cool. I could I could share. Oh, there's a comment. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what were you gonna say, Megan? Uh just that I should say that, you know, the way that I describe things, um, I, I totally agree with you, Vanessa. It's so nice to hear it so many different ways so that whatever speaks to you, you know, um, you know, we can grab that and make it work. Right. And sometimes, yeah, I'm a little bit of analysis paralysis, uh, lady, but for me, uh, in my, you know, kind of student voyage, I needed that. It was yeah. it was exactly what I need. Um, I never understood the people that were like, just think of orange and then paint it, you know. And I was like, I can't. <laughs> so it, it no, but it's a good point. And I um, need it for some things and not others. So right, yeah, we all just are unique in that way. Yeah, I actually kind of love this conversation because I tongue between my teeth on a, a general basis, and it's something that I've been told is potentially a problem, but for some reason it works for me. But I was always told that uh, articulation is uh, the like you have to create this plug, and uh, your your tongue is basically being whipped behind your teeth. And for me, that just meant that my tongue went through my teeth to create this seal. Um, so then when everyone was like, "Oh, do a da, do a na," I'm like, "That doesn't work between my teeth. How do I do that?" Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I've had to adapt my articulation. I don't always tongue between my teeth in especially every register, but uh, to hear you talk about the duration of the tongue um, is actually a really helpful uh, mental image for me to uh, oh. kind of help my articulation. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's so awesome. I don't, we didn't mean to ignore that, that question. <laughs> well, it's, it's a great question. question. So there the we go. one Karen. Yeah, thank you for asking that, and I meant to cover that. Um, no, please don't breathe your nose. <laughs> um, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, I only do it in exercises, and in fact, um, we'll do it 
a bit in a couple of minutes, I guess, um, when we get to high range. But it, it, it's specifically for the exercises that you want to keep everything just so, so still. Um, and that that aspect um, is pretty paramount to to building like range or sound or whatever. So thank you for asking that question, uh, Karen. That's perfect. And range in any direction. You know, it's, it's really reminiscent of if anyone has done Caruso method exercises, that's a big part of Caruso is, is breathing through the nose so that you, you maintain your, your setup and you can build a lot of strength and efficiency that way. Absolutely. How do you work on articulation okay. registers? Um, between your teeth and the low register. <laughs> that yeah. one works for me. <laughs> Definitely um, for me too. And especially as the, the lower you go. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, I actually have a great exercise for this. It's, it's yeah. something that um, I learned from Gord Wolf a, a long time ago. So you may have already heard this too, <laughs> Julian, but um, uh, an exercise that, that he showed me is to do a tongue stop, play a long tone, maybe with, you can start it however you want, breath attack or not but do a tongue stop and then repeat the note, freeze. Freeze wherever your tongue is and then release from that place. I like to do it in time. Throw something like. And you'll find that every note throughout your register might have a slightly different place where it's the most, most efficient place to stop the sound. And then from there, that might also be the most efficient place to start the sound. So kind of the quickest place for your tongue to get to. And you can just work on that throughout your register in different dynamics. And that was really helpful for me personally, at least to get clarity in my articulation throughout my range. That was the exercise I did that made me realize I tongue between my teeth. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Right? <laughs> So for me, I I love this question. Um, I I had a, a pretty big breakthrough in my high range when I actually just kind of doubled down on the exact common concepts we've just been talking about. So the fatter <laughs> and the quicker I I became. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the better I was in the high and low range. So basically if I try to make a very fat surface area and it not get in the way of that super fast air already, right? So I won't go too, too high then. Right? I would try to just be very fat and very firm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm trying to be professional here. Um, so I'm going to show you how I used to play when I wasn't kind of doubling down on all that. It kind of seemed like a moving target to me, right? So by making it a, a larger surface area, um, I found that I could almost be more confident about it, and it seemed to kind of work for me. And again, if, if you're going lightning fast and being a ninja, um, it wouldn't disturb that awesome airstream that you're getting. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, good stuff. So should we maybe go to the next uh, area of the, of the routine? Yeah, let's do it. This is my favorite one. So we're going to go to Who To now. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Okay, so Who To is my favorite exercise because it really um, it, it tackles so many aspects of your playing all at once. So who to, and this is also from Gordon Wolf, who's commenting right now. Um, so main goals with this one, okay? Air immediacy, that's number one, okay? Are you turning your air around immediately? And are, is it the correct kind of air? So slow, fast, you know, all that good stuff. Number two, proper setup for each note. Are you like way too big with your aperture? Are you way too small? Um, you know, are you kind of firm and nice and uh, ready to go right as soon as that air turns around? And number three, for the two part of it, uh, the timing of the air with the tongue. So are they happening right at the same time, right when you um, 
turn around the air is that when the tongue is going. And my favorite part of that is just when, uh, who are the, the breathing gym guys? You know, if you think about like throwing a dart or something like that, that that's really helped me for the, for this kind of exercise. Oh, it's a Charlie Vernon exercise. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so let's let's jump right into this one, okay? As you can see, the pattern is one up, one down chromatically, okay? So it just keeps spidering out, okay? And then we end up at F and F. So let's just do a bit of that together and see how that goes. So really what we're looking for is, and we're really ending, we're starting like a, brick right on that downbeat each time. So the first one is an air attack. Second one is a tongue attack. And I did write P slash MP there. And um, that's just because I find that the if we play quietly, we're really held to account. We can't cheat by playing forte. Um, so, you know, that all that... Um, the start of the note and all that good stuff is going to happen only if we're doing it very, very well. <laughs> okay, so let's just try that. See how, see how it goes. because I think you guys could hear that I was a little bit after the beat. So I can analyze that. And all right, this brings me to my second point. I come at this whole exercise with a positive mindset of analysis. Okay. And what that means is what I just played on that F sharp, I was a little bit late, which means my turnaround wasn't in relation to time. Right. So I would just do it again, be like, Oh, and really try to deliver that air right in time, okay? If I had done an air ball, I would have said, oh, maybe I have to be a little bit smaller for that note because obviously I was blowing too big of an aperture. If I, and on a two, if you go, you know, that means your air and your um, tongue aren't tied, right? Um, they're not timed right. So let's just do a couple more and maybe I can make more mistakes so that we can analyze my play. <laughs> Fair. Good, good. So relaxed that yoga session. This feels great. <laughs> yeah. I did find with those intervals, if we started going higher or lower, I might not have fared so well. <laughs> so that's what I was going to go to now, just to demonstrate how we can do that positive analysis um, in the extreme. So, in this direction, you can see that at F and F, it it stops right for the the um, pattern that's creeping out so at f what i like to do is i like to start growing chromatically up and you'll find that that actually gets you pretty tired which then you move to the low f and you go chromatically down which warms you down so it's kind of really best of both worlds so um let's let's just try a couple of those let's go f chromatically up um, actually, let's go F, A, B flat, um, just for time's sake. And then we'll go F, E, D for time's sake and see what happens. Maybe you guys should unmute for this one. <laughs>
you down, okay? I think we'll find more out this one. <laughs> ah, see, there we go. <laughs> so what did I do? I used a bit too much energy charged air for that note. And then it went, ah, right? So let's try it again. I would try to chill out my air a bit. I would try to turn it round very nicely. Nope. Anyways, and you'd be very kind to yourself, right? You'd be like, that's totally okay, Megan. No one's watching. But all to say, we use these to get better at these ranges. We use these to improve our turnaround of slow air, which is very hard. And we use these to fix that aperture that I never quite got right, right? We use these to uh, just really get to know our range and how we can make it better, okay? So no apologies, but no. I think that was great that I screwed up because uh, it can start that conversation, right? It made me I feel think it was great, great that, that you screwed up <laughs> and not one of us. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> But do you promise you didn't screw up? Were you just nailing those low Fs and you just... Oh, no, it made me feel better because I wasn't nailing it. <laughs> Inconsistent okay. would be a word I would use for mine. Yeah. Well, okay, should we so move on? Yes, we should. Sorry, Not I'm to running rush you through this so topic. But... A bit of high range. Okay, so my first high range exercise, we'll go a little bit quicker now. And my first high range exercise is to really get... Um, here, let me get my nose. Um, first, aperture formation, right? We want, we've discussed this before, but we want to make sure that it's like this, right? We don't want to be flattening out our um, embouchure at all because that makes the buzz go away and it's no good. No bueno. Again, I like to show students, right? Just th that way they can kind of see this movement. And then, Tip of the tongue. Uh, I don't know if this is a popular thing to say, but <laughs> I like to think about it as directing this the air straight out because I find that if we don't think of that sometimes, what we do is we the tongue comes up and it'll shoot the air into the top. That's when you get right because that that front of the tongue is blocking everything. So we need to make sure that we're blowing down. Like some people say, blowing down or if you like the directionality of that tongue, that's all good, but we need to fuel that embouchure, right? And the third is sometimes we get in trouble because the back of the tongue moves, okay? So really keeping that neutral and not getting in the way, okay? So this first one, and this kind of starts low, but sometimes we already start to creep in. So we turn on a, oops, that's pretty loud, eh? Well, we won't do it with a, a drone for now. Okay, so we're just moving through those registers. As much gliss, again, bonus points for the gliss. And then we're just moving up chromatically. So let's do a couple of those. Sometimes we might start to hear, right, that back of the tongue getting in there or anything like that. So we're really trying to, again, make it uh, simple so that we can try to get all those functions to work at the same time. And then please try it on your horn at home um, and stay with a partial. That's why I put those uh, um, slide positions in there so that we can uh, just try to have that same free blowing, same good movement um, as we go through the range, okay? And I'd like to cover the last exercise, um, which is on the next page. Yes, there it is. So this one is kind of coming at a, 
almost the same way, but we're really focusing on that aperture movement on this and, and really the focus of it, the, it's kind of like when you lift weights and you see some guys at the gym and they're like, yeah. And then some guys are just like doing very slow, very kind of focused movement. And this is the slow focus movement to so try to build that awesome um, camera aperture movement, okay? So Karen, we're gonna bring the um, breathing through the nose back. But again, this is just so that we're staying completely connected to our mid range, okay? So what we're gonna do is go six to one to six. And so I always tell you about bonus points. Here, it's bonus points for as slow as you can possibly go. Let's keep it at mezzo piano so that we're not overblowing and really injuring ourselves. And then what we do, six, one, six, breathe through the nose, come in on the same note, and then slur up and execute that next one. So we're going to try this. <laughs> to show yourself, you know, how little you actually have to move. But if we do it in the right way, if we come in, if we support, if we blow straight through that um, uh, aperture, we're just fueling this awesome machine that we've got going there, right? Do you guys yeah. have any um, ideas about high range and how you guys work on it? Similar. That's really awesome. Yeah, keeping, keeping the face together is, is a really good tip. By breathing through the nose for sure so megan what would you suggest to somebody that hits a wall there so they're they're glissing up and say they get to the when you're slurring from c to e and six for example like i think there's a lot of students where kind of that that fg is like a a wall area and then it's kind of you're trying to learn to break through to that next chunk of your range what might be happening or what can they do to work at getting over that hump? Yeah, I would say that the previous, excuse me, the previous exercises is, is, is the best to really bridge that. And sometimes when I've had um, students really struggle because they're, mostly they're moving that back of the tongue and it's pretty hard to um, get rid of. Um, then I actually move, instead of do, re, mi, I just go do, re, do. And then they kind of slink up very, and we're just trying to limit that movement, right? Those things that interfere with the aperture and the oral cavity, right? Um, and I would say nine times out of 10, it's either um, not blowing down with that tip of the tongue directing the air out or that back of the tongue engaging. So trying to bridge your mid range with your high range and trying to feel like that's very, very similar. Does that? I remember talking with you about some of these concepts and um, you started talking about, okay, where's the front of your tongue? Where's the middle of your tongue? Where's the back of your tongue? And I was like, I've never thought about the different parts of my tongue. So like, um, how, how do you separate those? Like, in your in your mind how do you learn to manipulate the different areas of your of inside your oral cavity well if you've ever been at u of t you'll know from looking at chalkboards i've <laughs> when i've been in the classroom i draw lots of pictures but um for the back of the tongue i just say when when you're speaking and you're like na 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 that position is neutral 
right? And that, to me, um, when you play, should be how it kind of stays, okay? So if you're coming up or down from there, there's going to be some um, problems. Um, middle of the tongue, we kind of uh, addressed it a little bit in that first resonance exercise. So that's when you go, I, and again, please um, do it along with me. When you go through that, you can feel that middle of the tongue moving up and down. And then the front of the tongue, like if you can whistle, like that's directing air, right? And then, so in the high range, I like to think of it directing it down. In the low range, we don't have time to get to that, I think. But in the low range, it's the same kind of concept because you're at an O, right? And even if you say O, oh, what is the front of your tongue doing, right? It's directing up, it's cupping. And so that gets that air out. And so as long as you're kind of uh, doing nice, beautiful, um, slow air, that's going to kind of help you. How's that going, Hillary? Sorry, I was really focusing on the position of my tongue. I'm definitely one of these high range players where the back of my tongue is almost always engaged, like 100% of the time. So I'm learning a lot. This is great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, thanks for putting this all all of this together, Megan. That's really fantastic. And I mean, yeah. I think it's just important to reiterate that a lot of this seems really simple and a lot of it is what you know, Megan kind of created this with her students at University of Toronto in mind, but this is stuff that you can never stop doing throughout your whole career. It's always great to just check back in and I definitely went through a period of my playing career where I wasn't checking in enough and that definitely caught up with me. And so I learned the hard way. You've got to do all this stuff. And even when it feels, if it feels easy, that's great, <laughs> but, but keep doing it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And brilliant stuff. I think I'll say is um, I'm still working on it, but we're going to put the, the uh, whole routine up that we just went through um, along with, uh, blurbs that I've written, uh, much like what I, we've been talking about. Just if anybody wants to check that out, we'll, we'd be more than happy to have you do that. And also, if there are any questions, please contact uh, the Canadian Women's Brass Collective on our website, on our um, Facebook, anywhere. Because uh, the last thing we want to do is throw out a bunch of information and not be available to answer some questions. Um, we're very into um, trying to help people, trying to get some good stuff out there. So um, thank you so much for this platform. It was really, really fun. Yeah, thanks, Megan. That was terrific. Thanks, Megan. And we've got some more great events lined up uh, the rest of the afternoon. So stay tuned. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to be back with um, our fantastic guest artist for the day, um, Audrey Ochoa. So go have a bathroom break, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Yeah.